Are we ready to go? The uh, Committee of the Whole on the, uh, the 2012-13 biennial budget is, uh, is back in order. And uh, the first thing that we're going to do is that the, uh, the council has uh, two things we're concerned about where we think we can uh, improve the bottom line. And uh, one we already discussed, which was the matter of sheriff's overtime. And the, uh, the second is the matter of the collection of court costs. Uh, I have asked uh, Trevor McAleer from our staff to uh, present us a summary concerning uh, what the collection rate is that's projected in the budget and how much uh, additional might be outstanding and would like uh, him to make that presentation. Thank you, Councilman Miller. Uh, I wanted to first acknowledge uh, Council President Conley and Councilman Gallagher kind of leading the efforts and working with Wade Steen from the fiscal office as well as the clerk of courts on trying to explore any solutions on trying to collect these delinquent taxes or delinquent fees. Uh, as detailed in the executive recommended budget on uh, schedule uh, room number two, page two, under uh, fines and forfeitures for 2012 and 2013, uh, the proposed budget, you will see the amounts of 10.6 million and 11.1 million. And of that, about t roughly $10 million makes up the fines uh, and the fees that the clerk of courts uh, collects on an annual basis. And about a month ago, uh, Keith Hurley from the clerk of courts office submitted um, a report to council showing that since 2002, there's a total of about $59 million that have not been collected from these fines and forfeitures, which if you can imagine if we can collect some of those, it would have a significant impact in our general fund. Um, that $59 million equals about 20, 27% of the total fees from 2002 through 2011. So we just kind of wanted to give you an update and let you know that we're going to be working with Wade Steen, who had a conversation with um, the state attorney general, and, uh, as President Conley mentioned earlier, and see if we can uh, try to collect some of this and have an impact on our general fund. So. I'd just like to follow up with, with uh, what Trevor is saying. Um, Mr. Steen was in Columbus one day last week, right. and he met with the people from the um, AG's office, and they are in the process of um, preparing an agreement, which we'll have to adopt as a, or as, a or as an ordinance, where the attorney general will be collecting fees and taking out money out of if you get any income tax return. And I haven't seen the agreement, but I may also be lottery winnings. Anything the state owes. Uh, individual, we would get our money ahead of them, gain any disbursement. So it was we already have that in, in the in the working. And this actually grew out of um, the task force that the executive appointed uh, in terms of, of collecting fees. And I've kind of uh, been working with Mr. Gallagher because of his experience in the court. Um, there's some things that need to be done here. Um, I'm recommending, I talked to Mr. Steen earlier, that we're going to contact the Bar Association and get someone from the, there's like a litigation section, a domestic relations section, a court of appeals section, hopefully get a volunteer to get a lawyer, get at least one lawyer that practices in these courts can kind of give us some tips as to how to get us through because I, I talked to a lawyer the other day, he finished his case, it was over, filed his final satisfaction, and two months later he gets a bill from the clerk's office. Now, that makes no sense to me, and Mr. Hurley sent me a long explanation of why they can't give you a bill when you file your final documents. Um, so that, their process has got to work. I mean, Muni Court, when you filed your final stuff, they gave you a bill and you, you had to pay up. So. Granted, some of this money is indigent, so we can't, we can't anticipate that we're going to collect all of it. But if we collected 10 percent, you know, we, we would be farther along. So this is going to be a work in progress. We're going to have another meeting of the task force on December 5th. Um, and I have spoken to Mr. Hurley and, and uh, Mr. First saying that we want a plan on December 5th. We want a specific plan of what they're going to be doing. Um, we did get a, I guess when they do the e-filings, it will help. Um, to be able to calculate the cost. 
And, um, you know, w w after December 5th, we'll see which way we're going, and we'll, uh, you will address this again probably mid-January or so to get an update, because we want some consistent updates from the clerk as to what he's doing. I would just add that uh, first to uh, commend Council President Conley and Councilman Gallagher for, for the work that they're doing in, in raising and putting forth this issue. And what I would like to do is to the uh, extent that we can become confident that a plan can be developed and that we can uh, raise a higher amount of revenue than, than the number that's in the budget, I would like to, uh, to put a higher number in the budget as a way of, uh, of really uh, stating that it's our intention to be intentional about this and, and to, uh, to see that we make progress. But, uh, but we can only do that to the extent that we can uh, really be pretty confident that we can, uh, can get a higher number, and I would uh, be inclined to be conservative as to how much of an increase we actually put in the budget and hope that we can actually uh, do something that's significantly larger than that. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't mean to be harsh about this, but this, this has been dragging. We, we have these fees from 2002 that haven't been collected, so we really have to put some people's foot to the fire and really be aggressive on this, and I think that uh, um, we need to maybe, well, you know, we've got some ideas in terms of, you know, you know giving, I don't know if we can get the amnesty, or, but we need to get these people in here paying these, paying these. I know in, in, com, in probate court, you put up so much, and I will mention that Nancy first was here earlier, and they're going to require a larger deposit when you are um, filing your case. But um, in probate, you put up a deposit, and then you, when your deposit runs out, before you can file any additional documents, you have to pay for the cost of each one of those documents. So there's, there's got to be a way that they can work some of this out, particularly in the civil. Criminal is a lot more difficult, but in the civil side, particularly in domestic relations, I mean, my opinion, you should not be able to get a certified copy of your divorce decree until your, your, all your fees are paid. So those are the kind of things that I'd like to work on. Any other comments or questions on this? Councilman Greenspan. Great, thank you. Mr. Chair, I'm unclear. Is it your intention to increase the revenue by a modest number with the expectation of receiving some of this money? Is that what you... That, that, that would be my intent if uh, between now and, and the time that we adopt this budget that we can, we can in fact become confident that a plan can be put in place and that we can be, uh, be reasonably confident that we're actually going to uh, collect more money in... in uh, yeah in court costs and the number that's here in the budget. But, but you, you know, we, and by doing that, we, uh, we announce that this is really important and is going to be a priority and it's something that we want to do, but, but also uh, we have to be conservative about it and, and probably uh, use a number that's considerably less than what we actually hope to get. Uh, Mr. Chair, with all due respect, I think this is going to be a year-long process. I mean, we, we, this is, some of these fines go back to 2002, and mm -hmm. we're going to work aggressively on it, but I don't think we should change the status quo. Then whatever money we get in will you know, be additional revenue, but this is not going to be the easiest task, because we, we, there, there's certainly a lot of this is going to be, particularly in domestic relations, it's going to be indigent funds that we're not going to be able to collect. But I think we should just go and charge ahead and see which revenue we can produce. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Okay. Uh, Councilman Greenspan. Thank you. I, I, would, I would echo Council President Conley's sentiments on that for a number of reasons. Number one, the, t the time it would take and it may take to get even a modest number of these collections because of the process. Um, secondly, the expectation that the revenue will be there, which means that there could be appropriations made against revenue that we very well may not collect either in 2012 or at all. So I, I think it would be it would be conservative to to not include this. Second of all, or thirdly, I forget where I am on this, I'm having a Rick Perry moment, but we can... Um, no, is that a Herman Cain moment? <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't know where Libya is. The question was not phrased properly. The... Um, lost my train of thought. We can still, as a council, make it a priority without putting it in the budget. And, and uh, we could, if we so wish to be as bold to um, pass a resolution 
encouraging the clerk to, to move on this quickly um, if, if that's a, a stern path we wish to go down. So just my thoughts on that. Councilman Gallagher. Uh, I would agree with uh, uh, both uh, President Connolly and uh, Mr. Greenspan. Uh, but I am more confident in, uh, in collecting more. And I think 2013, if we have this year to put the plan together, if we collected a quarter of a quarter of the money, uh, we'd be in pretty good shape. So that'd be 25 of 25 of the 59. So that would be my plan, to 25, 25, 59. Much like <laughs> uh, well, uh, I think that, that the council is, uh, is very, very serious about this as one of our, our top priorities, but I, I, would, uh, I would ask my colleagues if, if, uh, if, if I don't hear any objection, it, uh, I'm, I'm also good with that uh, that we would keep the number that we currently have in the budget, and and uh, we can we can take a look at it when we uh, do the next budget in November of next year, and if we uh, if we see that we're uh, bringing in more money, and we see that a process is in place, and it's pretty clear that we're going to continue to do so well, then maybe we could adjust it in in uh, in 2013. But but for now, we would leave the number as it is, but uh, definitely make it a priority to work on trying to get a, uh, a positive variance on that item that might, might help balance off a threat or two. Mr. Chairman. Councilman Jumana. You know, I, I think the practice here is just to continue to bring forward the accounts receivable for, for these okay. uh, expenses. And, and really, in, in business, uh, once you f find that something's bad debt, you write it off. And, and I think, you know, they, we, we should, I think the clerk's office should make the determination. And when, when the, the, uh, the person's indigent or there's no hope of, of collecting it, we shouldn't just be carrying these over year after year after year. We, we should have a reasonable amount of, uh, uh, hope of, of collecting these and the ones that are uncollectible get rid of them okay uh miss simon a quick comment um it, this is a long process and, and we have to factor in that there might be a cost to collection i talked to the clerk in lorraine county they hired out and, and there's a lot of complicating um, overlapping issues when you come to people getting their decrees and other things that, that might um, cause issues. So I think it's a long-term plan, but we're going to get more money just by raising the initial filing fee in civil cases, which should have been done a decade ago. So that actually we'll probably start to see an increase just on that alone. But yeah, I, I concur. We should wait. If, if, we, uh, if we're really serious about it and get a positive to trajectory going, we'll probably do better in 2013 on this than in 2012. Yep. Uh, just, just uh, I think the AG's office is charging, I think it was, was it 2%, Mr. Bino, do you remember? It was a, it was a nominal amount that the mm -hmm. AG's office would. Um, we, I, I intend to stay on this. Um, we have our, I said we had a December meeting and we have a, we'll be calling and we'll be talking again in January. And if necessary, we'll call the clerk in on a budget hearing. And we have the subpoena power to do that. We can call the clerk in and, and, and get a complete. So I think that he, he knows that we're serious about this. And I think, uh, you know, in the first year or so, then we'll, we'll, we'll revisit it and, and have him come in and give us a further explanation. Because once uh, we're, we're, we just want a plan, and that plan's going to take some time to be implemented. And I agree with Mr. Uh, Germana. Some of this we're going to have to write off, but so we can get a realistic figure of what we can actually collect. OK. Anything else on this? I mean, I see your point. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're, uh, we're about to move on to amendments, but before we do, I just want to uh, make everybody aware of something procedurally, which is that uh, even though we did not uh, ratify the substitute version today, on, uh, on Monday we did passed the package of the four page package of amendments and incorporated them into the budget resolution. So 
if among those items, if there's uh, any individual item that somebody has a problem with and thinks that maybe that item should not be included, well, they should uh, uh, treat that as an amendment like any other amendment and by next Wednesday uh, submit that on their list of, of amendments to be considered uh, on the 28th. Uh, amendments can be in the form of deletions and reductions as well as additions. And uh, I, I expect that there probably will be a few deletions or reductions proposed. So with that, now, is there anyone who has Mr. a Mr. Chairman. Uh, Councilman Brady. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to um, move to amend the resolution 2011-0291, uh, um, the biennial budget and capital improvements programs resolution shall be amended uh, as follows. I'd like to add um, uh, to appropriate a, an additional $750,000 uh, for the Adams Board. Um, this would be uh, for uh, the year 2012 only. Um, I had um, uh, would like to have uh, appropriated twice as much uh, for the entire biennium, um, but uh, given concerns about the um, amount of money that the Health and Human Service Levy may or may not bring in, um, I am um, uh, moving that we uh, appropriate uh, 750000 uh, more uh, than additional to what we have, what we appropriated last Monday. Um, and um, I would like to take a look, uh, this is not part of my motion, but after, uh, after we know uh, what the Health and Human Service Levy is going to bring in uh, next summer, I'd like to take another look at, at that and see um, if there's uh, the potential of um, appropriating additional funds. Uh, I know we had two hours of testimony today many, by many people of very uh, prominent, well-known, and knowledgeable in the community on these issues. Obviously, this is a drop in the bu bucket compared to what uh, the needs are. But we are able to um, identify what we can do uh, with the additional funds. And um, um, I would like, to, if, if people need it, would like some assurances about that, and I would, um, I'd like to ask the chair if we could bring Mr. Denahan up to, to speak to uh, not only the, the amount that was um, appropriated uh, on Monday as part of the starting point budget, but also uh, the, uh, on the motion uh, to amend that I'm proposing this evening. I second. Okay, it, it has been moved and seconded, and uh, I would like to call forward Director Danahan to uh, explain to us how he would spend an additional $1.5 million in 2012 and $750,000 in 2013. Chair, uh, Mil Chairman Miller and to members of the our council, uh, thank you for this opportunity to share with you uh, uh, the expenditures of $1.5 million for 2012. First, uh, look at the crisis units. Uh, you heard from St. Vincent's and Rosary Hall. I would uh, 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 make them whole on the the detoxification unit that they have there. I'd also look at uh, Salvation Army and Stella Maris because they also are crisis. They also have uh, detoxification units and find out if they, uh, uh, where they are at. So that is part of the uh, treatment for detoxification. In terms of other areas, in terms of crisis, another area would be the homeless shelter and uh, having two positions uh, for intake personnel, uh, which would, uh, um, uh, which would, we would hope uh, address immediately those that are in crisis in our homeless shelters. We also have other crisis units that I would look at, uh, but I would think that the, uh, the remainder bulk of the money would go to our, our um, outpatient um, mental health and uh, alcohol and drug uh, intakes. They are closed right now. And with the influ influx of money, I believe we could keep them, we could open them back up uh, from perhaps as early as next week and keep them open till perhaps the uh, beginning or the middle of March. 
if that's the case, uh, if, if you, uh, if this council votes on it, that's how I would arrange my priority, is to deal with the crisis units, but to support the crisis unit with getting the intakes back open, because if those intakes are not open, uh, we will need more money in the crisis units. Okay. Uh, discussion on the motion, Councilman Greenspan. General discussion on the motion. All right, I have a couple questions for Mr. Danny here. That, that can be included. Okay, very good, okay. thank you. Mr. Danny, just so, so I'm clear, because I heard some testimony here from some of the folks. From the county's budget perspective, from 2011 to 2012, are you, I don't show where you're receiving a decrease in county funding from the county's perspective. Is that correct? Uh, Chairman Miller and Councilman Greenspan, I, I believe you're correct. And that would be the first time in at least to, since 2009 where you have not received a decrease in county funding? Uh, to Chairman Miller, uh, Councilman Greenspan, I believe you're correct. Okay, all right, that was, that was, I just wanted to get clarity because some of the folks testified today that they wanted to be, they wanted us to reinstate out monies and I want it to be clear that the reinstatement is not from us, that we have been, if nothing else, we have held the line, the executive's budget has held the line between 11 and 12. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Councilman Greenspan, you're correct. We've been held harmless from the previous budget term. The, um, they're, they're, we're speaking to is when I took out 9.6 million out of our budget about four months ago as a result of a whole lot of other things besides locally. So that's what I believe they're referring to when they say restoration of their funding. So, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. Did the county uh, of this nine point some odd million that you just said were ta was taken out of your budget a few years, a few months ago, was that taken out from the county or was that from other sources? Mr. Chairman, uh, Councilman Green said it was the county and other um, the state and federal over the years. Uh, so um, for for 2012, the county held us harmless, but up to that time, we had seen a reduction every year for the last, I think, four or five years. Right, no, I'm, I'm sorry, let me, you, you said that four months ago there was $9 million, $9 million <laughs> reduction in your funding. Was that reduction in any part from the county? Any part of that $9 million, was that, were those county funds that were reduced or state and federal funds? Mr. Chairman, the bulk of it, and uh, Councilman Mill, uh, Greenspan, it's the council, bulk of that was uh, the state and uh, the erosion of funding over the years from um, the county. We wiped out our reserve and we wiped out our carryover funds from the previous year. We had nothing to begin with and we usually have a little bit of a reserve and a little bit of carryover. We had none at all and the county played a role in that. So um, the county held us harmless from this year, from 2012 to 2011. So uh, if we just had county funds to count on, then that's, that is the same. But uh, as it turns out, through all the changes that we've gone through, through all these years, uh, we found ourselves in a deficit of over $9 million. So when they're referring back in the testimony, they're talking about the money that we had to remove from their services. But the nine million that is a cumulative effect of of previous years reduction in funding. So were you not able then to? I'm looking at the reduction in funding from 09 to 2010 was 300 thousand dollars, and then from 10 to 11 was 3.6 million from the county. Are you saying that that were you, were you able then to modify your budget? So you wouldn't have to have that $9 million hit at one time? Because it seems like it was fairly predictable here. I'm trying to understand where the deficiency is coming from because I don't want the, the group that was here today to perceive that the county is not supportive because that seemed to be a consistent message. The county needs to be supportive and I believe at least in this year, the county has largely been support, has, is supportive by keeping it at least at the same level. And in previous years has not been dramatically, I don't see a $9 million drop going back to 2009. I just want to understand so people have a better understanding as to where the decline is and that it's not us because the perception is, is we're, I heard, we're not supportive and we're, they're asking for us to be more supportive and I think the county has been. 
Mr. Chairman, um, and to Councilman Greenspan, uh, if you look at 2008, we were at 38 million. Today we're at 33 million with the county. That has consequences. I don't know how else to put it to you. Uh, the county, uh, unfortunately, has not been able to meet the demands of the growth of funding needs that this county has over not just the last three or four years, but the last 10 or 15 years. As uh, has been testified earlier and shown in the needs assessment uh, shared by the um, uh, community solutions, this has been a, a long eroding problem. When you do not see uh, the decrease as much uh, in uh, the previous few years is because we did everything we possibly could to hold the line, hoping that it would change. And um, as I said, we had reserve and we had carryover dollars that, that maintained a lesser reduction in those more immediate years they're referring to. So I think it's, it's fair for you to say that, but I need to share with you uh, that this is a accumulation of, of over a decade of uh, what I believe a funding where the county has not been able to meet uh, the demands that we have for behavioral health in this county. Now, I'm not trying to find fault with it. I'm just trying to share what I believe was one of the problems. And, and, it's, and I, can't, I can't stand here and suggest that the county is the culprit here. Uh, you heard me testify that uh, the state, at the same time, uh, hit us with some dramatic decreases over these last two years. So uh, I think the county has been very um, uh, responsive and generous to us this year, holding us harmless during a time when the health and human service budget had a decrease. Okay, well, I, and I said this to you a few weeks ago. I mean, you're a phenomenal advocate for your for the agencies that you serve. So don't ever misunderstand my statements or anything. And you're right; there will probably never be enough money to to do the work you do. I understand we're trying to, to do the best we can. Just w just one question, this, I, I've never been able to get an answer out of this. In 2008, as an example, your budget was 38 million versus today it's 33.6 million. How many programs did you provide in, o in 08 versus today? I, I believe you provide less today than you did in 08. And wouldn't that then be part of the decline in funding because some of those programs now funded in other budgets? Well, yes, and it, it also defines a less services for individuals. Uh, uh, as I shared with you, and as folks that spoke of today, they're not getting services, and if there are services there, they have to wait longer for those services. In this last budget round, I, um, I ceased funding uh, eight agencies out of about 57, and, and, and for the remainder, uh, the, the overall reduction was about 22% of the funding we had. So I don't know if that answers your question. All I know is where we're at today. And where we're at today is the mental health and alcohol and drug is a disaster in this county. I don't know how else to say it, uh, that, that um, any <coughs> amount of money we could get, uh, we will use with those who need it the most and the most immediate. And so um, my hope is that, um, that this additional uh, resolution is passed so that uh, we could uh, infuse the crisis units uh, to have them able to deal with the demand they have coming and reopen our intakes at least to uh, uh, deal, provide services again for mental health and alcohol and drug. And incidentally, that would not just be for adults, it'd also be for adolescents. Okay, thank you. Councilman Gallagher. Mr. Dunahan, um, and, and I'm, I'm still puzzled as to, you know, um, St. Vincent's comes here and Stella Mars comes here saying, in essence, without saying it, they were saying it, that we cut the funds. How much did we cut from St. Vincent Rosary Hall of that 430000 they're talking? Mr. Chairman, for the year 2011, you didn't cut anything. Okay, then why are they coming to us to plug a hole we didn't create? Mr. Chairman, um, 
I don't think that's uh, what I want them to say. I can't tell them what to say. All they know is the Adam Board reduced their funding by $9.3 million. And, um, and they, in previous years, we had to reduce their funding because of county cuts. And there is accumulation of that. So uh, if, if you want me to stand here and apologize to you and to the rest of this council and county that somebody misspoke and tried to say it's the county's problem, oh, don't, don't do that. Oh, 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 don't spin this here. I'm asking a direct question. I'm not saying that, so don't put words in my mouth. Not asking you to apologize to anybody. I'm wondering why an outside entity is coming here and calling council people saying we have a hole that, quite honestly, the county didn't create. These are federal cuts, these are state cuts, and these are not county cuts. And we're dealing with a county going back six years that, have, that has cut at least 15% across the board in personnel and, and, and employees not getting any sort of COLA. So here's what I'm saying to you. The county's bleeding. The, the workers in the county are bleeding. I understand where you're at, understand where I'm at. I've got outside agencies coming in here saying we've got a hole. And I didn't create it, the county didn't create it, you didn't create it, the federal government created it, the state of Ohio created it, and now what you're telling me is we're the safety net for the federal government and the state of Ohio. I think that's inherently unfair to the taxpayers of Cuyahoga County. And I think it's quite unfair to you. But don't try and tell me that I'm telling you something. All I'm saying is, is that there's a problem here and it's money related and we did not create that. I appreciate where you're coming from. I appreciate where, where my mother called me and yelled at me about Rosary Hall. I grew up hearing about Rosary Hall and didn't even know what it was until I got a little bit older. It's provided great services directly to my family members. So please don't try and tell me, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing something I'm not. I'm, I'm quite concerned about this. But if it's the federal government and the state of Ohio that are creating these problems, let's focus on that. And if, and if the 430 you're asking for to plug that hole, let's be honest, and say we're plugging a hole for somebody else's problems. You know, we're not like the federal government printing money that doesn't exist. We're not like the state of Ohio that spent money like drunken sailors for 10 years. And then all of a sudden we're $10 billion in a hole and everybody's looking around. We're the result. We're a new council. Understand where we're coming from. I'm trying to do what's best and most frugal and quite honestly conservative with the taxpayers' money in Cuyahoga County. And I understand your cuts but you're not the only one bleeding. We're all bleeding. And I wanna do what's fair and right. And I'm not trying to create a problem for you, but I want you to tell me that this isn't Cuyahoga County doing it. This is the federal government and the state of Ohio doing it, and we're the ones charged with fixing it. And if that's the fact, then let's move forward on that. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Councilman Gallagher, you're absolutely right. I think, um, the thought of that you could help us comes out of that. And uh, this has a huge amount of uh, hope that why you didn't start this. And, um, and, we, and we, as I advocate here, I do the same thing on the state and federal level. And it's far more egregious and far more deep and far more severe. And it is the hope uh, that, and the testimonies today, that you will help us. That's, and that comes out there. And um, I, uh, I, I, my hope is that in this conversation, that it's clear that uh, you didn't start it. I understand that. Um, my hope is that you could help relieve some of the pressure we have that is started not only by the federal government, but the state government. And my emotion is placed not directed to you, but directed at the whole thing. I have, and we all bring certain things to the table here. And, and this in particular hits me square because I'm a recovering alcoholic. And I understand this. I've lived it and continue to live it. And I've been lucky because I wasn't as bad as some others were. But I've seen the other side of it. 
So I've been both places. And my concern is directly for what we're dealing with here. And I just wish we could be honest with the fact that it's not just trying to get money out of the county to do this, that, and the other. This is a state problem. This is a federal problem. And they heaped it on us. And now it trickles down. And, it, and it's completely broken. And it just really angers me that we can't be honest and look ourselves in the mirror. We're going to have to make decisions on this that are very difficult. Very difficult to do. And I'm in particular going to have a, a real struggle with this because I don't know if I can go for this. I know the need. I know it's there. It's not going to go away, and it never does. You know that. But I want to get as much as I can on the table before I make that decision. And I want to be fair, and I want to be honest with everybody. Any other discussion? Councilman Rogers. And, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. During the presentations today, we heard from a number of organizations that talked about the backlog that they had on people waiting um, to get treatment. And I, I heard um, at least one organization say that they had over a thousand people waiting. Um, and they've have to, as you said, they've closed their doors. I'm wondering with this, um, you said that. If we were to increase this funding um, up to 1.5 million, that you would have the um, crisis units reopened and begin services to these people again. How much of that backlog realistically can we eat into with that amount of money? Mr. Chairman, uh, Councilman Rogers, um, um, for the, uh, that was the housing. And residential, as Kathy uh, Kazo, who testified that uh, my notes uh, suggest well over a thousand people uh, were on a waiting list uh, for residential care. Mm -hmm. um, the amount of money that we're going to get uh, would would um, would not make that bit of difference on that particular part. I wish it would, but it can't. Let me share with you and the council, uh, if I may, uh, where the money was taken from on the budget this past uh, July 1st. For our crisis units, a million, one million, ten thousand dollars. For outpatient treatment uh, units for mental health, two million, one hundred sixty-seven thousand dollars. For our treatment for detoxification, six hundred forty-three thousand dollars. For our outpatient and alcohol and drug, $977,000. For our outpatient treatment for adolescents, $628,000. For our consumer organizations, $275,000. For our mental health and alcohol and drug residential services, $2,105,000. For our employment services, $63,000. For our prevention in schools, $53,000. For ad, uh, alcohol and drug prevention services, $821,000 for a total of $9,307,000. What we're talking about is uh, $1.5 million. And we have, have worked on a priority why we set this as to have the least amount taken from the crisis unit, from our housing, uh, from uh, children, uh, and th those three years, and they did not receive the 22% cut. They received cuts of between 9 and 12%. So um, in answering the question, where would I spend the money, I would first spend it in the crisis units. Then I would put it into uh, alcohol, uh, the adolescent and uh, uh, adult uh, intake units so we could begin the treatment. But all the other units, um, there just isn't enough money to go around to do satisfaction with it. And that's, that's where we're at. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate the um, uh, issues that have been raised by my colleagues, uh, both by uh, Mr. Gallagher in terms of a sense of how big this how big this problem is, and and that it wasn't one that um, 
that was uh, caused uh, in any significant way by a, a lack of um, of uh, concern by by county government for the most part. Um, I uh, also understand uh, Councilman Rogers uh, uh, view and trying to get a sense for how much good can we do with, with what is obviously a relatively modest amount of money that I want to um, uh, draw from the public assistance fund and, and I agree uh, I agree I guess the only thing I have to say about this kind of work is is that um, if there are if there were a hundred people out there and I was trying to save their lives and I knew that I was only going to be able to save 10 of their lives, I still believe that we should try to save, save those 10 lives. When, it, when a person has a problem like this, um, amount, uh, amount of months, six months, one year, is a lifetime or not a lifetime. And uh, that's the way I view uh, this, as a modest attempt to save somebody's life. My, uh, my feeling on this is that uh, we, all, we all in this room support and know the need for mental health services. And uh, we can come to different conclusions as to uh, whether we have capacity to do a little bit more. It's a very high priority for me and I, I think I think we can, and I think it's good that we're doing just the first year and waiting for the reappraisal and other information before we act on 2013. But uh, I would uh, certainly not take it if anyone can't support this motion that they don't uh, support mental health services. We have to make some very difficult decisions. Ms. Simon. Wanted to echo Councilman Brady's um, view of this, and there's, I'm not going to get into it, but it matters to the starfish. That's, I don't know if you've all heard that, but it matters to the one starfish. If there's a myriad of millions of them on a beach that are stranded, if you can save one, it matters to that. And so I, I, I take that view with the, you know, additional help that we can do for the, especially at this crisis time. So we're, we're in extraordinary times. I mean, this isn't something that we've faced, you know, since I've, been around I think with this I've said it it's a perfect storm so um, if we can find a way to do this without going below the 15 percent um, reserve you know I, I think it's a modest request and will matter a lot to some thank you councilman Jones uh, thank you mr. chairman uh, am I correct on this understanding that this amendment uh, for these dollars are coming 100 percent out of the health and human service levy that's correct. We've had so much concern about right-sizing our county government, the number of employees, and concern about whether the calves are going to play if the season is scrapped and where those dollars are coming from. Um, my question probably is directed toward our OBM director, Matt Rabino. Uh, Mr. Rabino, can you tell me, can we use any of our health and human service levy dollars to to meet our payroll, to meet uh, any of the any of our ex expenses, such as debt service and. I'm at Rubino Office and Budget Management. Uh, Mr. Chairman, to the council member, we, we already are using levy dollars to pay for operating expenses. Remember, the levies are the local match for health and human service programs. We're spending dollars on employing people, contracting for providers and other services and all the other things that go into um, running health and human services. So we are already using those dollars on top of the dollars, again, we're getting from the state and federal government to fund fund those those programs. So, uh, with, with the Adams Board, it's a direct subsidy. We're actually providing a direct level of assistance, levy dollars paid directly to the Adams Board, and then they, they, they decide how to direct those dollars whether it's internally or to the various providers, some of them who are here today, that, that benefit from the, the county support. And it, you know, an analogy would be Metro Health, same thing. Metro Health has very large budgets, over $700 million. County's providing that $36 million direct assistance from the levy dollars, and they're, they're applying it towards one particular area of their operations, so similar thing there. The, uh, the levy dollars can be used 
very flexibly, but it has to be for uh, health and human services programs. It can't be for, for general government. It can't be for public works. It, it can't be for uh, any of those other things that are outside of human services. Councilman Jones. Last, last question. Uh, we've just set 15% as the benchmark and 25 for the general fund. Is there a, a grade and what I mean by this, is there like a band that you would imagine where the lower we get, we actually get into a, a dangerous area? In a sense, if we're at 15 percent, uh, if we're above 15, it's like being in the green. Everything is abundant and fine. But if you get too low now, you kind of move into a yellow area and then a, a red danger area. Um, is there, beyond just the 15 percent, is there a, a percent you would throw out? Because I've heard there are other counties who have gone as low as 9% and everything was fine. So could you describe, give us percentages in your estimation? That if we go below 15, we're in the red. Or if we go below 10%, we're in the red. And is there a yellow area, so to speak? Well, through the chair to Councilman Jones, the 15% provides us but it's essentially a threshold. Doesn't mean we won't go below that. And there's a chance we could go below that. You have there. there are, obviously, there's procedure in place if we decide to do that. To, to give you a number, uh, I, I, folks tend to work with the round numbers. It's probably 10 to 15 percent, generally speaking. But I think there's a lot of situational information you need to factor in. And we've talked about what are, the times we're looking at right now. We know we have some potential threats when it comes to property tax valuation and maybe other cuts coming from the federal or state level, possibly in the next few years, 15% gets you to a, a safe area, knowing full well you may have to go, go below that. So it's, it's not so much picking a number and sticking with it, it's understanding the policy is 15% in this county. Um, some of the other counties have different levels of, of threshold, but again, they're also spending their dollars differently. You think in terms of we have two levies, turn mega levies, we have a high degree of discretion. Um, some of the other areas of, of the state may be providing support for uh, de development of disabilities and other areas. We have our own levy for that here. Um, so I think the idea is pick a target or a policy, stay with that, with the understanding that if you have to go below that, there, there, that's a decision point. How long, how much, and what's the plan uh, going forward? with how you are using the dollars you have. Uh, and, and I'll just say again, to echo my colleagues, Dan Brady and, and Councilwoman Simon, I, I do support uh, uh, things, uh, the things that have been presented, the amendment, and, and all that Councilman Brady said. To Councilman Jones, I can, uh, I can give you a worst case scenario. Currently, our health and human service levy balance is at 20% of expenditures. While the administration is proposing to draw on the public assistance fund, the administration has advised us that, that some of the additional health and human service spending that the council proposed would need to come from the levy fund rather than the health and human services fund. If we were to presume that not some of it, but all of it, came from the Health and Human Service Levy Fund, and we added the 750000 that's proposed here, that would bring the total to an additional $4.5 million, which is 2% of the, the $220 million annual H and HS expenditure, so we would reduce the reserve level from 20% to 18%, but it would still be uh, well above the 15% threshold. And that's, uh, that's assuming that, that all of the additional H and HS money would have to come from the uh, levy reserve, and actually it's going to be some kind of a split. Councilman Greenspan, well, then Councilman Germana. I'll defer it. Okay, Councilman Germana. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, to Mr. Denahan, uh, I'm just wondering uh, on how, how much of the Adams Board is, is federal funding from, from the federal government, and 
how soon would you know if there were going to be making cuts in the future? I mean, how far out are you budgeted with federal money? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, to uh, Councilman Germana, um, the federal uh, government uh, is is responsible for the Medicaid, and um, that Medicaid uh, on the uh, pays for uh, about 65 percent of uh, the budget, and the state makes up the match, and. Um, so of a $150 million budget, uh, that's probably close to $90 million. And that's out of Medicaid. Um, the dollars we're talking here are the non-Medicaid dollars. Uh, in Ohio, um, the Medicaid um, benefit package has 24 parts to the package, and Ohio has only qualified for six. The non-Medicaid dollars, which is the dollars we're talking about here, makes up for that which is not covered under Medicaid. And, for example, housing is not, crisis is not, employment not, is not, those coming out of prison is not, the, the money we use for the schools is not, for our seniors is not. So uh, the, 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 the state, as uh, I think uh, Mr. Gallagher uh, has, has pointed out, uh, has reduced that funding significantly. And, uh, and so that is part of the problem that we have. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, okay, I'll just tell Please you Please be brief. I don't have to do it. If you want me to stop, I'll stop. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, you know, and I guess we're going to be talking about Mr. Greenspan's proposal uh, next, but uh, just like I said here a few days ago, um, I think in, until this Health and Human Service levy is renewed, I think we, we need to be conservative, and we also need to find out what, what the federal government's going to be doing. But uh, I, I support giving as much uh, because the health and human service levy is the people's money that they want us to spend for health and human service. And uh, so if 15% if is the responsible amount, uh, I would like once we get into the first four or five months uh, of next year, be able to maybe appropriate more health and human service money to, to get at that 15% margin if uh, when we know what, what the uh, uh, Wade Steen said that uh, by May he would have a good idea of, of what the uh, real estate taxes, uh, how much the decline would be. So uh, I, su I support this uh, going forward with this proposal. Councilman Greenspan. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I I, um, I consider myself to be, be pretty straightforward. Most of you know that by now, one way or another, whether the comment in favor of a, a, an alternative position or not. I, I agree with what Councilman Brady said insofar as being able to support people who are less fortunate. I, we do have a social responsibility to help help those, and I don't think anybody in this county, regardless of any belief whatsoever, would support that notion. My greater concern, and, and, and I'll say this, I, I'm not going to support this. I'm probably not going to support any spending in the budget until we get a better handle on what's going on with some of these other items in our budget. If we, if, if $4 million takes us to 18% and we're off by five points on the property tax reassessment, that's $11 million. That puts us below the 15%. So I'm uncomfortable not in theory with helping those, but we have to keep in mind, we have not cut, and I asked this question, Mr. Rubino, I don't believe we've cut anybody's budget from last year to this year, and specifically the Adams Board. So we are not deficient in providing the services or the funding for the services necessary from our perspective. I am looking at the long-term objective here. If we use levy dollars and we get hit with and we'll talk HHS side. If we get hit with the reappraisal issue, 5%, 10% is devastating. If we get some 
numbers coming out of Washington on some the super committee unable to come to an agreement and mandatory federal cuts come down. We're not just looking at not being able to provide funding two years down the road, but three or four years down the road. And that's where my, my scope is looking at a, great, a, a larger horizon than just 12 or 24 months. And that's where I'm not trying to preserve money. You're right, Councilman Germana, this is the people's money. We need to be, be prudent with that. At the same time, we need to be responsible. And, and the two go hand in hand. Prudent in the fact that we need to make sure the money goes and people get services they need, which is what Mr. Denham is advocating, but responsible for a longer term horizon. I don't feel comfortable yet knowing yet what the long term revenue horizon is going to be, but we're getting close. We're within six months of having a better grasp on the property tax appraisers issue. We're, we're close on the super committee issue coming out of Washington. Um, we're close on the MBA season on the general fund side. These issues are close enough for us to be able to, in my opinion, hold off on some of these decisions um, until we see what's going to happen so we don't put ourselves into a situation of significant peril. There are counties in this state that are not making payroll. I don't want us to be one of those counties. Any other discussion? Ms. Conwell. Uh, to Mr. Greenspan, to my colleague Greenspan, I, I just feel that I agree with you that we need to be in stable and, 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 and sound and all that good stuff, but what message are we sending to, if you're talking about hold off for six months, what message are we sending to those those employees that are out there in the health and human service field saying, you're not, you're not spending, you're not throwing us a little lifeline, just a little lifeline. And then we're asking those same individuals to turn around and push this health and human service levy. So we're in more dangers than one because if this health and human service levy doesn't pass, we're in dog doo doo anyway, is what I want to say. Well, thank you. I'll I'll, I'll respond to that. That's exactly why I'm suggesting we defer the spending so that the residents of the county see that there's, if, if we're perceived as propping up federal and state government on HHS levy spending through the, through the, our own levy, I'm concerned about that perception as well. We need to demonstrate that we are, are fiscally responsible. We're not taking money, we, the county, are not saying to Mr. Danahan from our portion, we're, we're not reducing his funding at all. That's my point. If we were reducing it and he's coming to be made whole on our appropriation, then I would, I would, I see your point. But we're not doing that. We're, we're maintaining his, his level, his spending level, and I just want to ensure that we are looking out for the long term. I'm looking beyond six months. We're saying carry on, Mr. Denahan, and let's look at six months and see where we stand. Our revenues up? Are they down? Are we able to manage our expenses? We don't know these these items yet. This is our first budget the county's first budget that we we voted in, the executive has compiled. I want to make sure that we have everything we need and the budget will prove it out because as I said last week, the budget is nothing more than a financial measurement to an operational objective. Council, Councilwoman Simon. I just have a few comments and it's getting late, but the notion that somehow we're not being responsible for budgeting health and human service levy dollars when we are maintaining, at least with the projected revenue, 15% safeguard reserve, I'm not sure where the, the notion that we're irresponsible comes from. I don't understand that. Secondly, we're not propping this up and, and nobody's saying that somehow that, uh, let me just back up, that's our job. That's the reason we have a health and human service levy is to provide health and human service to people in need. So this money is there and people are in crisis and, and the state and federal government has failed those citizens. That's why probably people are on Wall Street right now. That's our responsibility, at least I as a council person, to use the dollars we have responsibly to provide for them, these people in a, in a crisis situation. That's why, why that money's there. So I don't understand this notion somehow that we're propping up the state and feds. We're, we're providing for the residents of this county. That's the very essence of why this county originally came into existence was to provide this type of, of aid. So, and of course we're looking down the road. Nobody here is a drunken sailor on a spending spree. We're, we're talking a modest um, increase for a crisis. Okay, we've had a good discussion. I. Uh, 
I respect uh, all the viewpoints that have been expressed. It's time for the clerk to call the roll. The, the uh, roll is being called on the Brady Amendment regarding the uh, Adams Board subsidy for 2012. Calling the roll, Mr. Jones? Yes. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Ms. Simon? Yes. Mr. Greenspan? No. Mr. Miller? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. Mr. Germana? Yes. Mr. Gallagher? No. Mr. Schron is absent. Ms. Conwell? Yes. And Ms. Conley? Motion the carries. AJ's a two nays. The, uh, mo the motion is approved and the Brady Amendment is incorporated into the budget resolution. For purposes of uh, amendment, I recognize Councilman Greenspan. Okay, thank you. The, the two amendments you have in front of you, amendments two and three on the document, as I mentioned, amendment one will carry over till the 28th. Um, once again, what I'm trying to do is just establish a, a policy um, and, and with Amendment 2, expectations. So, for example, as I mentioned earlier, the, the amendment to, uh, number, or number 2 on this document, one-time expenditures, all we're doing here is, is saying that when we make expenditures above the executive's approved budget, whatever the time period's approved, if it's one year or two years, but it's considered a one-time expenditure, meaning that the agency should not expect, or whomever's getting the funding, that it's a long-term expenditure. Um, that'll be carried on into multiple budgets. It can, however, in a subsequent year budget, be included in, in the budget itself through the normal budget process. Does that make sense? I mean, that's, does that make sense? So let, let's say, that, let's say that, that Mr. Brady's amendment right here for $750,000 a year was, was approved for two years. Right now, the expectation may be that in year three, this $750,000 is automatically would automatically be included. So what I'm saying is in year three, when the, when the 2014 budget is put forward, if it's the expectation, hope that that be a permanent part of the, of the budget, then it would be added at that time. That's all, that's all I'm trying to say, is, is uh, just explain what the expectation when council approves an expenditure above the executive's recommended budget. Uh, Councilman Greenspan, would you uh, want to move that item number two on your sheet be incorporated into the budget resolution? I would. There's a motion. Is there a second? Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Is there a discussion? Mr. Chair? Uh, Ms. Simon. Uh, I, I just want to state that I don't think we need to legislate expectation. I think it's expected inherent in a two-year budget that we're going to be coming back and looking at things very carefully. And after this arduous process, those who are seeking um, additional funds for their budget, no, I think just from what we've gone through that this is not an automatic. I don't think we need to legislate expectations. I think they're there, and I'll say it loud and clear, don't expect if this does pass that you're going to get this every time. Any other discussion? Mr. Mr. Chairman. Councilman Brady. Um, I appreciate what uh, my, my colleague is, is trying to do, restrain spending. Um, but this is a biennial budget. I don't think there should be any other expectation that it's anything but a biennial budget. And in the case of the appropriation uh, that was just uh, supported, it was in fact uh, uh, for one year. Um, so I don't think there's ever been any expectation um, that uh, we're doing anything but uh, looking at, the, at a budget for the next two years. Any other discussion? Uh, Councilman Rogers. I, yeah, I'd just like to echo what um, Councilwoman Simon and Mr. Brady just said that, you know, every, if you look in the history of the budgets that we can see just in this book, that from year to year, um, budgets go up and budgets go down. And we've seen, we've heard from Mr. Denahan today that, um, you know, if you go back to 2008, there were severe cuts. So at any given time, I think it's going to be incumbent on the members of the council um, as they go through the two-year budget negotiations and, and discussions that, you know, departments are going to know that every budget is going to be different. And I, I, you know, I don't, I don't see the, I understand the, the, um, I understand what's behind it, but I also 
don't think it's necessarily necessary. Any other comments, Councilman Gallagher? Yeah, I, I would uh, tend to agree, having done a few budgets myself, I think this kind of muddies the water a little bit. Um, it, like the Brady Amendment was specifically a year. It's a biennial budget. Um, I don't think there's any expectations beyond 2012, or I'm sorry, 2013. So I don't find it necessary to have such language uh, going forward. I mean, uh, unless you could tell me a, a, a more of a reason. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, the, I just, uh, I want to avoid a situation where someone says, we built our staff, we did this, with thinking this was going to be part of a longer term plan. Um, that, that's the whole impotence behind it. I don't mind withdrawing this. I obviously don't have support for it. Um, I don't mind withdrawing it, but I just want at least the, the, the expectation to be out there that if it's a one-year appropriation, it is a one-year appropriation. So, or it's a two-year, whatever it is. So I don't, I don't mind withdrawing it if <coughs> Councilman Duran will withdraw his second, and we'll just move on um, to the next one and, and hopefully get out of here shortly. Okay. The, the uh, item has been withdrawn, and I recognize Councilperson Greenspan to uh, uh, move the third item. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Now, this one, I might not have support on either, but this one I'd actually <laughs> will not withdraw, mm. assuming I get a second. Yeah. Um, this one really just has to do going back. I don't want to be redundant, but w this Would you make, start by making a motion? Oh, I'm sorry. I'll uh, make a motion to uh, approve uh, number three on my uh, memo dated November 17th, uh, funding okay, no, protocol. Item number three is moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Well, Just for discussion. Thank you. The, w this goes back to my concerns that I stated earlier with my uh, decision on, on overall spending, as I explained during the Brady Amendment. I just think that we have too much, and this supports the fiscal officer's position of asking us to wait. Uh, he, he said three to six months. I took it out six months. Um, to wait and see how some of these items that are out there, such as the reappraisal process, I throw the super committee and the MBA, at least let's see how they, how they, um, what the, what, how they come to fruition or don't come to fruition or what the impact is to our budget because we don't know. It's easier to project expenses than it is to project revenue. And all I'm saying here is, as I said, I'm not going to be in favor of probably most, if not all, of the spending. I know I'm in the minority on that. So what I'm trying to do here is say, okay, if spending is going to be approved in the 2012-2013 budget, give us at least a window to see where the revenues come in. If the appraisers, appraisals come in lower, we, I, we, I used the, the number was 2.25 million for every 1% on the levy side, HHS levy side. The general fund numbers are much greater because as I learned, and I wasn't familiar with this as much as I, I, um, I am now, that, that reappraisal adjustment in fact impacts both the inside and outside levies to a greater degree than it impacts the HHS levy. And so my concern is, is if we, if we don't wait until May, I think is what Mr. Steen said, and we start spending and then we find out that we've got a significant difference in the appraisal estimates that this budget is based on, we're gonna have to come back and make some, some pretty dramatic cuts. I'd rather have us not be in that situation. Give us three to six months, as I say, six months here, before we implement any of the spending above what's in the executive's recommended budget. So anything council approves, all I'm saying is wait and see what the revenue looks like coming in. That, that's, that's the whole purpose here. I, uh, I seconded this motion because I uh, know that Councilman Greenspan put, put time and thought into it and, and should present his uh, motion before the council. But, but I do have concerns about it both on technical and on process grounds. On technical grounds, my concern is that as of July 1, uh, we're not going to have hard revenue numbers because we're going to be in the middle of the year. We're going to be uh, operating on, on estimates and projections. And I think it would be very difficult to determine whether the conditions in this proposal are met. The, uh, 
concern I have on process grounds is that, that this measure separates out the items that, that were changed in the budget and, and, and added by the council from what was in the original administration proposal and, and puts the, uh, the council items at a lower level in, in that, uh, that they're, they're predicated while the, uh, the original part is, is automatic. And my, my view of it is that once we make the amendments to the budget, it's a single and whole document. There aren't items that are more important than other items until we make that determination. And if we got to July 1 and we found that there's, uh, there's a serious problem and the reappraisal was awful and, and uh, the feds did some bad things and, 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 and we have to uh, make reductions, well, then I think we come in at that point and we, uh, we do a budget review and, and we uh, examine all the revenues and examine where we are on the expenditures and, and uh, make some decisions at that time. And, and uh, that's the process uh, that I prefer. So, uh, so I respectfully don't support this, uh, this proposal. Other comments? Councilman Gallagher. And I'm wondering if it wouldn't be easier if we just, and what I want to do, and I, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to support much of anything unless I have the hard cap at 2515 as far as the reserve. If we have that, we have that in ordinance, then it becomes law, something comes in, we, we, we run into trouble, that means we got to go in and we got to cut. We got to cut to that level. So we know the level we have to go to. And the other, and the other, on the other end, if things are good, you know how much you can spend. And no one's going to say that you're out there overspending because we've got a hard level where we're going to have as a reserve. And the bonding companies are going to like that. I think our credit rating will be, will be moving in a positive direction. And I think that kind of makes everybody happy because you know where you're at. You know what you can spend, you know what you can't spend. And if we had that, I'd be very open to supporting a lot of things in this current budget. But not having that and not knowing that and not knowing for sure that if bad things happen and we're going to go down to that 25 level, I, you know, I, I'm a little nervous about that. If I had that, it would change my view on a lot of things. So I think that would be easier. Okay, I, uh, I point out that there's uh, language in the uh, resolution as it now stands uh, stating our intention to maintain the uh, 25% level on the general fund and the 15% on H and HS. Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate that, but but intents are intents, and 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 a, and a codified ordinance is a codified ordinance, and and one's much stronger than the other, and one definitely sends a message to the powers that be that we're a serious contender for being conservative in our spending and protecting the dollars of the, of the tax public. And I think, I, I think it's a strong, fair message for, for all of us. But that's just my opinion. I am, a, I am an advocate of a uh, legislated reserve policy. And, and Mr. Councilman Mr. Greenspan. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, the, and to Councilor, Councilman Gallagher's point, there, there is hopefully legislation that will be coming um, to Council President Conley for the December 6th uh, to create ordinances that will do just that, to be sent to committee for discussion. The, the, the reason, real quick, and, and, and I may stand alone on this, and I'm, I'm okay with that. I, um, the, I, I support this because our chief financial fiscal officer recommended it, but also because I, I believe listening to what, what he, he and Mr. Rubino have said, there's somewhat of a glacier coming, and I don't want to wake up one day and look out my back window and see it there. I think these appraisals are going to be lower than 5% from what I'm hearing from them. I just don't want us to get stuck. This just prevents us from getting stuck. That, that's, that's all. That's the only thing I'm saying. Anything else? Councilman Rogers. Yeah, never mind. Oh. Mr. Chairman. All right, Councilman Jones. 
and I, I express my intent to be supportive of the percentages, 25% for the general fund, 15%. Um, but now that I, I think about it, the hard numbers to me seem philosophically, things just don't go automatically from good to bad, that there's some grading. And, and I, I just expressed it a little earlier, but I would like, and I don't necessarily need an answer right now, but don't you think that there is some gradual descent in a sense when you're at 33% or 30 plus percent now, we're in the green. But at some point, if we were to keep spending, it would gradually turn, I'm gonna say yellow, and then eventually get into a red area. Is there any way to acknowledge that in our legislation, uh, create some ban where 24% things are really gonna hit the fan, but at 26%, we're in the green. <laughs> um, you can kind of get a sense of what I'm trying to express. I don't know what percentages are. Is 20% really, you, could you spend down to 20% and you kind of be in the yellow, so to speak, or? Uh, I, I think that's uh, definitely a very uh, fruitful area for, for consideration when we uh, uh, discuss Councilman Greenspan's legislation in committee regarding the uh, long-term reserve policy. Councilman Gallagher. I'll be real quick. Things can go bad overnight, and, and it almost happened three years ago. It almost completely fell apart. And so it, it can, and it might happen, and we need to be prepared. And that's why in the 2515, because it doesn't come out of thin air, it comes from our experts that we rely on, and that's why I say that. I mean, if they said it was 2010, that's where I'd be, but there's at 20, 2515, that's why, I, and if we could... Co Councilman Gallagher is, is totally right, but I hope 2008 was once in a lifetime. I might be wrong, but I hope so. Uh, uh, call the roll. On the amendment. Calling the roll on amendment number three from Mr. Greenspan. Um, Mr. Jones? No. Mr. Rogers? Ms. Simon? No. Mr. Greenspan? Mr. Miller? No. Mr. Brady? No. Mr. Germana? No. Mr. Gallagher? Yes. Mr. Schron is not here today. Ms. Conwell? No. And Ms. Conley? No. The nays have it. Two yeas and eight nays. The uh, uh, amendment is not included in the budget resolution. I still love you guys. Uh, <laughs> much. Uh, I can't imagine that there's anyone still here waiting for public comment, but I'm still going to ask. Since we've been here since one o'clock this afternoon, I hope, any, I hope Ms. Johnson notes that we've been here since one o'clock this has afternoon. Has anyone signed? Been here since ten. Mr. Chairman, no one has signed in to address council. Is, is there a motion to, to adjourn? So moved. Sec moved and seconded to adjourn. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. We're adjourned. I'm going to stir crazy. I feel sorry for you. You had two extra hours. You got here at eight? Oh, yeah. Well, I was, oh, you were I there. I was down there, but still, it's like sitting. Investing children for Ellen. Yeah. And they had no meetings this weekend. And I had to rush out here. See? No. And then I was here when you got here. Mm -hmm. So I was downtown, I think, at 7.30. I was in my office. Everybody, the cops were, the security, they were like, we ain't seen you down here. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.